Welcome, everyone, to this Professional Development Hour presentation brought to you proudly by the Atlanta Metro Chapter of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. Before we begin, we'd like to let you know that any opinions presented tonight are solely the opinions of the presenter and not that of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, the National Society of Professional Engineers, or any other of its affiliates. We certainly hope you will enjoy tonight's presentation. So sit back and relax, and on with the show. Good evening, folks. Tonight we are privileged to have with us um, a specialist in patents and intellectual law. He's part of the Taylor and Dun Taylor English Duma Taylor English Duma Law Firm uh, Intellectual Property Division. Uh, although he has. Uh, a, a law degree. degree. He, he puts, puts Esquire after his name. He can he also put EIT. He, he passed, passed the fundamentals, fundamentals exam back when? 2007. Yes. So uh, he, uh, he specializes, specializes in reviewing, reviewing custom, custom uh, clients' uh, ideas uh, for, for patentability, patentability uh, how they, they might proceed, proceed with licensure of the, their idea, uh, the, the options, options of patenting, uh, prosecutes, prosecutes patents. Uh, you, if, if somebody, somebody gets, gets a patent, patent it's, it's not, not up, up to the, the government, government to enforce it. it. So, so he can assist in that area. So, so thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, Glad to be here. Ru Russ Russ Dumba. Dumba. Thank you, everybody. Uh, like Roger said, my name is Russ Dunlap. Uh, I am an attorney at Taylor English Duma. I'm a partner. Uh, my practice is patents and intellectual property. Um, my background, uh, I am a, not a Georgia Tech engineer. I know that's all, most of the engineers here in Georgia, but I got my uh, mechanical engineering degree from the University of Tennessee. I moved down here, uh, got married, and uh, went to Georgia State for law school. I worked as an engineer for a uh, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection firm designing plumbing systems and commercial buildings uh, for a year before I decided to go back to law school and pursue my original pa uh, passion, which was, uh, I had always wanted to go to law school and I decided I, I really enjoyed the science of engineering and technology and decided to become a patent attorney. I decided that in high school and carried it through getting my engineering degree uh, all the way through law school. So. You know, the, the great thing about my job is I get to see new technology every day. I love that about my job. And I love coming and talking about what is intellectual property, what, uh, what are the steps you need to be taking to, to protect that. Because uh, there's so many things that you don't think of uh, when you think of intellectual property. They kind of fall through the cracks. You might think it's one thing or another. Uh, and, and even what I've got listed here, there, there's more to it than that. So just in general, intellectual property is just any intangible property. Uh, that's mostly a creation of your mind, whether it be an invention or an idea or an artistic work or something like that. Uh, you know, it, it has value if you are the only person that can use it, if you have some sort of monopoly on it. And that is what intellectual property law is kind of based around, is giving inventors, artists, creators, uh, monopolies on their work, their ideas, uh, for some period of time to let them recoup their, their, their investment in that. Now the four primary types of intellectual property, um, I list trade secret first because that's the one people forget about. It's uh, you know, anything that's secret that uh, has some sort of value because it's secret. Uh, patents are what most people think of when they think of intellectual property, an invention of some sort, whether it's a product or a process that is protected with a, a patent. Trademarks are source identifiers, it's branding, uh, it's whatever you use as a company to identify the product or service you're selling. So when they see the trademark out there, they know you are the source of that. And finally, copyrights, that's uh, artistic works, uh, ex ideas, uh, or, or uh, expressions of ideas that are protected. Uh, but it's not just you know artists that you, that you would normally think of. There's a whole area of copyright law around like software, for instance. Uh, but there's also other types of intellectual property. Uh, the big one that's getting a lot of press right now are your publicity rights, your name, image, and likeness, which is taking over the uh, football landscape and uh, college athletics. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different uh, types of intellectual property. There's a lot of categories, but these are the four main types. 
So let's talk about trade secrets first. Um, like I said, it's, it's something that is a secret and it has economic value because of its secrecy. And the third important part that people don't think of often is that you actually have to take steps to protect it. Uh, the nice thing about it, there's no government filings, there's no uh, filing anything with the US or the state government. As long as you're taking the steps to protect it, whether it be uh, through your IT solutions, your, your uh, cybersecurity, or through a locked cabinet, uh, you can protect it and keep it protected. Uh, oftentimes you often will also use your employment agreements, your confidentiality agreements, uh, having those in place as well are used to protect it. Uh, there's in fact a new-ish federal trademark law that came out, I think it was 2016, that actually uh, at the US, at the federal level, protects trade secrets as long as you take the necessary steps to protect them. So not usually prior to this law is all state by state. If you want to, you know, if some one of your former employees leaves, takes some confidential information with them to the next company, uh, the Coke formula or something like that, uh, you have to sue them under state law. Now there's a federal statute that if you use, if you go by the guidelines of the federal statute required to protect your trade secret, you can actually sue under federal law. And oh, it mentioned on here, this is one of those that. It's indefinite. It, it will last as long as you keep it a secret. So, for example, the Coke formula is the big one that everybody thinks of. Uh, as long as you keep it a secret, that thing can be a trade secret forever. But there's a lot of examples that people don't think of. Obviously, your software code, the internal stuff uh, in your systems, um, your engineering plans. A lot of times, uh, you might prepare some drawings or something that's that's really for you and your client. And if that's kept secret with confidentiality agreements, that's a trade secret, uh, especially if it's not if it's not something that would become public. Uh, chemical formulas, Coca-Cola formula, for instance. Um, but you know your uh, medical, uh, your pharmaceutical formulas, things like that, especially before they go to market when you're developing these things. They could be a trade secret for a limited period of time until you actually publish it. And But while you're developing it, you want all that stuff secret. That's a trade secret you want to take steps to protect. Uh, some of your marketing, your internal materials, your client contact lists, your potential clients, your marketing plans, all of those are uh, trade secrets that as long as you're taking the necessary steps to protect them, and if somebody tries to take them from you, you have uh, legal recourse to you know, stop them, to seek damages, things like that. And like I mentioned, you also want to protect them uh, with confidentiality agreements. You want to look at your employment agreements uh, and, and make sure that they actually say, yeah, as an employee of this company, you agree that uh, you're going to keep everything in confidence that, that we tell you that you would keep our trade secrets and then when you leave the company you understand that uh, those trade secrets are still the company's they they don't get to go with you and you'd be surprised how many employers do not have stuff like that in their employment agreements or you or, or you find out oh yeah yeah we have that employment in our employment agreement well did they ever sign it uh, no no we, we don't we don't have a signed document from them so uh, you're in trouble so let's go on to utility patents. That's, that's my specialty. I do all sorts of uh, intellectual property, but patents are where, it's my bread and butter. It's what I do day to day. Uh, the two primary types, there's, there's some other types, but the two primary types are utility patents and design patents. What it does, what benefit it provides is covered by a utility patent. Uh, what it looks like is a design patent. The ornamentality is a design patent. Uh, there's also plant patents uh, is, is another example. Some countries have like more standard, some very basic patents called utility models. Uh, but the two primary types are utility and design patents. Now these are more formal. You have to prepare a document. You have to file it with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And uh, I mentioned here first and soon. In the US uh, and, and most of the rest of the world, it's the first person to file a patent for something is the one that has priority to obtain the patent on that invention. Uh, prior to 2012, in the US, if you could prove that you invented it first, even if you filed it second uh, with a competitor, for instance, then you, uh, you would have priority. But that's no, no longer, we, 
we pass some laws to kind of eliminate that long, complicated process and align with the rest of the world. So you want to get a patent application on your invention filed quickly in case somebody else comes along and decides to, you know, comes up with it themselves. Uh, it's also important that the patent is originally owned by the person that invents it. So the ownership rights are with, uh, you know, with the original inventors who contributed to the conception of the idea. Uh, so normally what happens is your employment agreements cover this oftentimes, but you would have a, uh, some sort of assignment that you have your inventors execute to the company that the company would own it. But as long as you have to get that trail of ownership established for your company, for instance, to own it. Or as an engineer, you know, while you are, maybe, maybe you, some of you are consultants that come up with these things, oftentimes your agreements with these companies you work with would cover, okay, as part of your agreement to develop this for us, uh, you agree to assign your rights to it to the company. That sort of thing needs to be locked up. Because if one inventor uh, has, has contributed to one of the ideas and you list them but you don't get an assignment from that inventor, that, that inventor owns just as much as the company does and can do with it whatever they want. So it's important to have the, the, those uh, ownership rights locked up. Uh, a patent, once you get it issued, it prevents, you, you can use it as a sword, not a shield, to prevent other people from making, using, selling, offering it for sale, or importing it. Uh, you can't use it to defend yourself, as in, oh, you have a patent, but I also have a patent on a modification of it, therefore you can't sue me. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you will have the uh, ability to stop somebody from infringing your patent, but that doesn't mean that you might not be infringing somebody else's patent. So if you make an improvement on somebody else's invention and they have a patent on it, you still are infringing their patent if, 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 they, if, it's, if it still covers what you're doing. Uh, once you file a patent application, you are patent pending. So you have to go through the patent process first, but you file a patent application, you're patent pending. You can't sue anybody yet. You can threaten people, but you can't sue them. And then when it issues, then you can mark your product with patent number XXX, whatever. Uh, I think we're in the 11 millions of patents now, and we're in the 1 millions for design patents, which uh, that shows you how many design patents there, there are now. It's just gone, uh, that, that particular area has gone especially crazy with people filing design patents on everything. It's become more and more valuable. Uh, so you might have heard some people say, well, did you do a search before you filed the patent application? That is not required. You do not have to do any sort of searching. You don't have to know anything about what else is out there. And many companies will not do any searching because they don't want to know. They don't want to find out about somebody else's patent and be, you know, now you're aware of it, that could raise the damages on how much you would owe them if you're infringing their patent. So they don't want to know uh, what else is out there. We'll file the patent application and let the patent office do the searching. The patent office will do the analysis and we'll just see what they, they come up with. Uh, but sometimes it's helpful if you're investing into a product uh, and you want to kind of know, is it worth getting a patent on this to put this money into it? You can run a search first. Uh, either determine if it's patentable or if it's infringing somebody else's patent. Those are kind of two separate analyses that you can do uh, together in one search, a combined search, or you can do one or the other. So this is uh, an example utility patent here. Uh, this one, I don't know if you can, probably can't see it very well, but you know, this is the example front face of a patent application, or patent for a utility patent. Uh, this is a flow diagram. Sometimes there, there are flow diagrams that are uh, provided as uh, you know, an illustration of a process or how like a bit of software code works or something like that. Uh, these things last 20 years from the earliest filing date. So you file a patent application, uh, it gets allowed, it gets issued, you could file child applications, but they're all the, the called continuations or divisionals. But uh, the gist is that that first filing date that you have, that's where that 20 year clock runs from. So you can't keep a patent alive by keep filing continuation after continuation. You're kind of set on that first date. And it's adjustable a little bit if the patent office takes their time, which happens a whole lot, and uh, they go past their like statutory requirement for how fast they should 
look at your application, then you might get some extra time added to the end of it, but it's, it's not a lot. It might, I've seen it up to two years, but it's usually around like 30 to 60 days, something like that. Uh, it, so you file the patent application, the utility patent, and unless you pay extra fees, because the one thing the US Patent and Trademark Office loves is fees. They love getting money. Uh, so they have fees for everything. So you can pay them extra money and they'll move it a little faster. But normally you file a patent application and you're looking at about anywhere from one to three years until you hear anything uh, from the patent office. When then they finally get a, pick, it, pick it up, a patent examiner looks at it, picks it up, and uh, they'll do a search to see is your idea new and not obvious. And then you start the negotiation process with them. Oh, this isn't allowable. No, yes it is. Or let's tweak it a little bit. Let's amend this. Uh, there's a negotiation process on that back end until you both get aligned and uh, the examiner agrees, okay, this is allowable. I'll issue a note of allowance. You pay another fee and you get a patent. The, uh, so that process can take, I've seen it up to, up to four years, but um, I've seen it go fast. For some, it, it depends on the technology area too. Some I've seen, we didn't file any sort of uh, documents to, to move it along, but you know, six, nine months after we filed, we got an office action, which was very surprising. Uh, it just very much depends on the examiner and the art unit you in, you're in, the technology unit you're in. Um, the other thing too is that there are categories that you can use to accelerate it without paying extra fees. So for example, if you're over 65 years old, you, uh, the, if one of the inventors is, then you can ask for it to be accelerated and those move along a lot faster. Uh, or if it's uh, an environmental technology, for example, a green technology, there's some categories that you can use. Or if you know of somebody infringing your idea, copying it, there might be some categories. Uh, the easiest way though is just pay the extra fee and, and, and move it along. So the utility patent includes a description, drawings, and claims. The description uh, is just a whole overview of the invention. What is, what is the invention we're seeking here? What are some alternative ways of making it? Some alternative ideas around it? Because you don't want to just describe your one invention that you've come up with. Because what you're trying to do with that description is come up with, okay, if, if I release this to the market, what are my competitors going to do? This thing takes off. What are my competitors going to do? They're going to try and make their own product. They're going to try and design around my idea. So you want that description to be kind of as broad as possible. This, these are all the different ways of, of doing my idea. Uh, not just the, this might be my preferred way of doing it, but here's, you know, 10 other ways of doing it as well that I think is encompassed by my invention. And then you have drawings to support it. Here's a couple patents that I've had issued for my clients. This being a, a, a winch system to carry like roofing tiles up to a roof uh, with an automatic system. Uh, this one would be a fire hydrant leak detector. It goes on a, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to, I think I stepped in front right, of the light. You're fine. But uh, that's a fire hydrant leak detector. It screws on to a nozzle on a fire hydrant and can use acoustic uh, sensors to detect for leaks in the system, listening for water leaks. So there's, uh, you know, those are two, just two examples of, of patents that, that I've issued for my clients. Uh, and then finally, the most important thing about a patent is the claim. The claim is what you use to enforce this thing. So the claim is basically, it goes at the end of the patent application and it is, I claim a device comprising X, Y, and Z. And if that claim issues into a patent, then somebody comes along, they sell a device comprising X, Y, and Z. You go to a court, you say, hey, judge, they're selling a product, they're importing a product, they're making a product that has X, Y, and Z in it. My claim is for X, Y, and Z, therefore they are infringing my patent. This one, for example, is here, is, is for that nozzle cap leak detector. Claims a nozzle cap for a fire hydrant, uh, it comprises a cap body, a vibration sensor, and it had a metal insert basically that is in the system that basically attaches metal to metal contact between the sensor and the body of the fire hydrant because the, the housing was plastic in, in this case. So vibrations don't really travel through plastic very well for the most part. So the whole idea was we have this vibration sensor that's in the housing and there's a metal insert that goes through the housing from the interior to the exterior and 
the, that way when we screw this on to a metal fire hydrant, the vibrations can travel through the metal insert into the uh, acoustics insert. So that's kind of encompassed with this claim, and this is what we would use to uh, assert this patent against a competitor, for instance. Now the nice thing is you don't have to have just one claim. You can have as many as you want. Of course, if you have too many, you have to pay extra fees. <laughs> No surprise. But you have up to 20 claims, 20 total claims, and they can be uh, a product like a nozzle cap. It can be a method. Uh, I think this patent had claims for a method of using this thing, a method of installing it on a fire hydrant, uh, or a method of assembling it. You have methods for making a product, you have methods for assembling it, uh, manufacturing processes, all of those things can be patented with the utility patent and you can patent that with, uh, with the claims at the end uh, of your patent application. All right, let's talk about design patents a little bit. Uh, these have gotten more popular as my career has gone on. Uh, the nice thing is they're, they're kind of easier to do. Uh, these last from the date that it issues as a patent, you have 15 years to enforce it. So uh, this doesn't matter when you filed it, it matters when, you, uh, when it issued. So this one would be, uh, I think it says August of, no, April of 2020. So this one will last till April of 2025, or 2035. Uh, this one is a little less expensive than a utility patent because it's just easier to put together. Typically, it's just the drawings, basically. You have a front, a back, left, right, top, bottom, and a perspective view of a particular product. And that's really what the claim is. It, you have a, your description is just kind of a boilerplate. I claim what's in these drawings. That's my invention, this is what I want my patent to protect. And uh, often, uh, for our practice, we often put an appendix in there uh, that shows other views or other embodiments of the invention uh, just to kind of provide support. And if we want to file a continuation later, uh, we have appendix to kind of support that description. The uh, time to patent this is typically less than a uh, utility patent application. Uh, utility patent application is probably like three, you know, it could be three, four years. Uh, design patent, it's usually around one to two, although there's been more of a backlog. So I've seen three years a few times. It, not as much, but uh, it, it, it's still quicker than a utility patent, but it's uh, it still takes some time. And, uh, the other thing to note is that you can have a patent two patent applications on one product. You can do a design patent on what it looks like, and you can do a utility patent on what it does, what, what functional benefits it has embodied in it. So in this case, uh, you think, uh, I don't know if we filed a utility patent on this one, but there was a similar product that had a movable, uh, movable posts. So we filed a utility patent application on the movable posts and then a design patent application on the body itself. So that, sure, if, if somebody wants to knock off the movable idea and they just make it look different, they're infringing the patent. But if they just knock off and copy the body itself, they're, also, they're infringing the design patent. Uh, this is pretty important in consumer goods because consumer goods, they're sitting on the shelf, they have a look to them that has some value to it, but also how they work has value. So often I will advise my clients, let's, let's do both. Uh, if, the, if the funding's there and, and you think it's worth it, uh, it doesn't hurt to do both a design and a utility patent application on the same thing. So everything I've just described to you is just the United States. This is country by country. Patents are country by country. So within a year of filing your patent application, uh, you have one year for utility patent applications to file elsewhere, outside the US. Uh, for design patents, it's only six months. Uh, the fortunate thing is there is what's called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, the PCT, which allows you to file one application, uh, and we typically would file that in the U.S., and that gives you 30 months from your original filing date. So let's say you file uh, a patent application, um, you know, tomorrow, Fe February of 2024, you've got two and a half years. No, wait a second. Yeah, two and a half years to decide what countries you want to file in. And pretty much all the countries are signed on to this treaty except for a couple like North Korea, Pakistan. Um, you know, Taiwan is not a member because China doesn't want that. Uh, so, but for the most part, any country you'd want protection in is part of the PCT. So the easy thing to do is file your PCT application and kind of kick the can down the road so you can figure out, okay, what, what countries am I actually going to sell this thing in? 
outside the US. And sometimes, you know, if you know upfront, I'm not gonna sell this anywhere but the US, you don't have to file a PCT application. Uh, save yourself the money for the filing costs. But it's a nice method of actually, you know, making sure that you, ha you preserve your rights in any countries you might sell in. Uh, I talk a little bit about software patents. I mean, I, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I don't deal with these that much. I often refer this work out to one of my colleagues who's an electrical engineer or computer science engineer, uh, something like that. But the, the software area is, is pretty hard to get into, uh, to get patents in. Uh, outside the US, it's nearly impossible. Inside the US, there's a path to do it, and you really need to work with an attorney on that because uh, software and business methods have a lot of hurdles in that the general abstract ideas are hard to get a patent on. Uh, you know, laws of nature and things like that, you're not supposed to be able to get a patent on. So uh, math, mathematical equations, things like that. So uh, the court system so far has been uh, equating a lot of software type patents to those things. Oh, this is just a, a math problem that you put into a code. Or this is just your normal method of doing business, but you put it into a software code. There's ways to get around this, but you really need to talk to a, a, a specialist attorney to figure this out because the path forward is often a little more complicated. And for, for some companies, like startups for instance, uh, you might know that, yeah, it's gonna be really hard to get a patent on this thing, but the value of being able to label it patent pending, whether it be for investors or business partners or the competition, just to put it on your product, that has some value to it because that lets people know you are serious about your IP rights. That you're serious about protecting what you own, what you think you own. So it kind of puts everybody on notice, okay, before we knock this guy off, let's back off a little bit and either see what happens or do a little research into it or uh, you know, see, see where this patent application goes. It's just kind of a warning. This is uh, very important that uh, in the US, you really have a hard deadline that you've got to get your patent application filed. If you publicly disclose this thing, your invention, you have one year to file your patent application. Let's say you show it off at a trade show. This happens all the time. You show it off at a trade show, you sell it, uh, something like that, you put it on a website, and then you kind of sit on it like a year and a half later, oh, I, let's go talk to an attorney about it. It's too late. You can't get a patent at, on that in the US. Um, it, Outside the US, it's even worse. Most countries, if you've publicly disclosed it without filing a patent application anywhere, so you, if you file one in the US and then publicly disclose it, you can use that filing date in the US to get a patent outside the US. But if you publicly disclose it first before you file anything, Europe, China, Japan, and a whole other bunch of countries and markets are now, uh, you can't get a patent there. There's a few other countries that have these one year grace periods, but they're not many. So it's important to consider, you know, consider your patent rights early. Consider your IP strategy early uh, before you start, uh, you know, start taking it to market, taking it outside your company. You can use confidentiality agreements too to protect the ideas because something disclosed under a confidentiality agreement is not a public disclosure. Disclosure, uh, except, except this is a big one uh, for engineers and if in startups. Let's say there's a, pub, uh, a private sale doctrine because it's public disclosures or sales. We, I've had clients, solo inventors, startup companies, they go to a company, uh, a manufacturer, and they get a prototype built for them and they buy it from that manufacturing company. They, it's under a non-disclosure agreement, so nobody, it's not public at all. But that's a sale, even the inventor himself buying a product from, a, from somebody that's gonna make a prototype for him, that qualifies as a sale and starts that one year clock ticking in the US. Outside the US, it's not a public disclosure, you don't have to worry about it, but uh, it's, it's, it's really, we thought the last round of legislation on this had fixed the problem, but the Supreme Court looked at it and said, no, 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 you're still, they still didn't draft the statute correctly. It's still, the, the private sale doctrine is still, still in force, so. Just think about that if you're partnering with another company to build something for you, even though you came up with it, that can start that one year clock running. But in general, using NDAs is the best practice. And the best, best practice is just getting something filed before you 
you know, before you file, before you publicly disclose anything outside your company. All right, let's talk about, I'm not doing it on time here. I got 20 minutes, right? Eight o'clock? Is that what I'm aiming for? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's uh, talk about trademarks. I mentioned earlier, trademarks are source identifiers. They could be anything that kind of identifies your goods. Here's a few examples, obviously Google, Coke, Apple. Uh, phrases can be used to, uh, you can trademark a phrase, just like just do it. Slogans. Uh, you can trademark colors. Target has the trademark on their red. So does Coke. Uh, Lululemon is right here. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Lululemon. Uh, your favorite sports team probably has trademarks on their specific color. I know uh, Tennessee has a trademark on their specific shade of orange. So uh, you can have trademarks in a variety of things, not just, just names of your product. You can even have trademarks in your product packaging, the product looked itself, which is called trade dress. Um, but for all of these, you would have to do some sort of registration to protect it. Uh, whether it be state by state, there are state trademark offices. You can get a Georgia trademark on something. But most people, they use the US trademark system. Uh, you file a federal registration. It's examined by uh, a trademark examining attorney. And it's kind of like a patent. You have a negotiation with them to get your trademark allowed and registered so you can enforce it if somebody starts using your trademark to sell their stuff, their, their goods or services. Uh, the federal registration here kind of gives you a list of things that you get from the federal registration. It gives you kind of nationwide priority. So, you know, if, if you come to market and you're only selling in Georgia, but you get a federal registration, and somebody else comes along and starts selling in, let's say, California, you might not be able to sue them yet because you're not in California, but you now have priority to go to California and push them out if your market extends to California. Uh, it allows you to sue in federal court. It also lets you use the circle R symbol, um, but the circle R symbol is, is interesting. You don't have to use the circle R symbol. You can use the TM symbol for your product, and you don't even have to register it at that point. If you believe something is your trademark, you can put the TM on it. So once you have the, uh, the, the federal registration, it also kind of just, this courts automatically assume you own it. So it would be on the other party to, assume, to prove that you don't own it. Kind of flips the, the burden of proof is what it's called. Like I said, you can get state trademarks. I know some clients that have gotten Georgia trademarks, for instance. Um, the federal trademarks, there are two classifications. You're either using it and you file a trademark application for it because you're using it, or you think, okay, I, I'm gonna use this. this is a, I'm gonna take this product to market in a few months, so let me file it as an intent to use application. It's a little more expensive. You have to pay a few extra fees, but it gets you priority sooner. Uh, and it kind of reserves your spot in line. And then once you start selling it, then you, then you can file a statement of use that says, okay, I'm selling it, here's a picture of it on the market, or you know, here's a picture of my product with the trademark on it, and uh, now you can go ahead and give me the registration. Uh, processing times, 12 to 18 months, although I've heard from my trademark colleagues that that's gone up. Uh, they, uh, this is also like trade secrets, Last, last forever, as long as you're using it, as long as you continue using it, then it can last forever. Your federal registration, you have to renew it, obviously. You file a, uh, a renewal every 10 years that just shows the trademark office you're still using it. Uh, and once you do that, it, it's maintained for another 10 years. And you just keep doing that as long as you're selling the product. So Coke, for instance, yeah, it can keep, we'll keep selling Coke for probably till the sun explodes or whatever, but uh, they will have, as long as they keep renewing it, they'll still have that trademark. Uh, like, the, like patents, you have to file uh, for trademark protection in other countries. Uh, six months is the deadline to file. Uh, there's another, M Madrid protocol is kind of a system that you can use, kind of like the PCT system, to use your federal ap trademark application to just file in other countries to kind of make the process a little bit easier. Um, like this says, 130 member countries, so it's most of the world, most of the places you would want to get trademark protection would be a member of, of this. I'll move back one quick second. The other thing, when it comes to trademarks, a lot of, I mentioned the circle R. If you're in, selling something internationally, I often recommend my clients just use the TM. If you get a circle R, that's great, but if you're selling that product outside the US, 
and you have a circle R on it in a country that it's actually not registered, you can lose your trademark rights completely in that country. So if you take your widget that you have a trademark on and it's got the circle R on it and you go sell in Europe and you don't have a European trademark, you've lost your European trademark rights completely because you've sold a product there that has a circle R in it and it's not actually registered. Uh, so it's, in general, it's easier just to put the TM on it and be done with it uh, when you're selling internationally. Copyrights. Uh, obviously, the things you think of with copyrights are art, books, <coughs> you know, spoken music, spoken word, music, uh, movies, things like that, but it's, it's more extensive than that. You have copyrights in uh, any sort of expression you have that has some sort of artistic uh, merit to it, and that includes software code. Software code is copyrightable. So often, and it's so easy to get copyright that a lot of software companies will just file for a copyright on it just to say it's protected. Uh, but like the name says, it only prevents people from copying it. Um, if they come up with the software code themselves and they don't copy yours, that's not a violation of your copyright. But it's a good layer of protection, for instance, if you have uh, software. And it is, uh, the, the definition is, if it's fixed in a tangible medium, medium of expression, meaning paper, you know, music, whatever, something hard that, that uh, is semi-permanent in, in a way that you can prove that you know, this is your work going forward. You can also get federal registration. It's very easy, very cheap to do that. Russ? Yes. I understand that uh, lots of things can be copyrighted. A cookbook can be copyrighted. Correct. But the recipes in it cannot? Correct. That is called idea versus expression. You can get a copyright in the expression of your idea, but you can't get a copyright in the idea behind it. Recipes are a good, great example, actually. Um, you, the software code is the same thing, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, your software code does something. You can't stop people from making software code that does the same thing. You, they just can't copyright the way you've written the code. So often uh, companies, software coders have often put little things in their code that are maybe undetectable errors, like it won't affect how the code operates, but they're just uh, naming conventions or something like that. And if you go, if somebody comes along and, and uh, has their own code that does the same thing, they can look at the code and you can see, oh yeah, they put the same errors in that I'd had. They obviously copied what I did. High white maps used to have pounds in them. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a map. That, would, that used to be a huge area um, of, of copyright litigation. And that was a way to prove it. You put a fake, fake place on the map. And uh, if it was copied, then, then you knew it was, if, it, if that was in another map, you knew it was copied. Uh, so some other, you know, in the computer space, like I mentioned, software code. And you can protect these with multiple layers too. Software code might have a copyright in what, how it was written. It'll have a patent in how it functions and it might have trade secrets in some other aspect of it. You might have uh, trade secrets in maybe how the code operates on the back end that nobody can see and the high level functionality maybe you have a patent on. Um, there's different ways you can protect it and you can have mul multiple layers on it. And obviously you can have a trademark on the code that you package and sell. Uh, other things that make that can be copyrighted, the look of a screen display, user interface. You can also use design patents for that as well. So the look of something can be protected with both copyright and design patents. Uh, video games mentioned here, obviously a ton of copyrights in that because that's a very artistic creation. So let me uh, spend the last few minutes talking about some interesting hot topics going on in my field. Uh, I mentioned uh, to a couple of you earlier that artificial intelligence is a big hot topic right now. Uh, how that uh, plays out will be, uh, remains to be seen and how it's going to affect uh, inventions and IP. Uh, there's a huge area of law. I, I, I attended a two-day webinar just a couple weeks ago uh, with sessions across the board on all these different aspects of artificial intelligence from, you know, can a AI draft patents, can they do uh, legal work for you? Uh, or for uh, are, are an AI engine, if you're having it create work for you, is it pulling 
publicly available stuff? Is it pulling copyrighted work, uh, trademark work? Is it you know, violating a patent? It, it could violate somebody else's copyright. Uh, there's a huge area of copyright issues there. If it's being used to generate something and it's using copyrighted work, uh, there could be some violations of copyright laws there. The interesting thing in my area in the patent space is that if you use an AI to make something, some sort of invention, there is no inventor, there is no patent. A patent has to be created by a human. So, for instance, uh, this was recently resolved, or it's kind of working its way through appeal, but I'm pretty sure this is how it's going to play out. Uh, an inventor created an AI intelligence, had the AI come up with something, filed a patent application for it, listed the AI as the inventor, and the court said no, that is, that's not patentable, you don't have a human inventor behind that, uh, therefore it is, uh, you know, it's not patentable. Now that was, a, he, he did it as a test case because he wanted to see if uh, an AI could get a patent. But uh, you could use AI as a tool to help you, you know, there's kind of two prongs of inventorship, the conception of idea and a reduction to practice. The inventorship is really in the conception, but if you're using an AI engine to help you reduce it to practice, to help you take your idea and build something out of it that's, that's workable, that you'd still have a human inventor behind that. Uh, another area that, that's interesting, uh, you know, AI being used to generate art, uh, same issue. There's no human author behind it, so there's no copyright. Uh, it actually goes back to a case um, from a few years back where an, a, a photographer set up a camera in a nature preserve. I don't know if how many of you saw this, and a monkey took a selfie of himself. The, somebody used the image, uh, and the photographer sued that person, and said, "You're violating my copyright." Court said no, monkey took that picture. Monkey's not a human, monkey's not an author, uh, therefore there is no copyright in that image. Personally, I kind of disagree with that. I think if you, you as an author set up a camera for a monkey to do something with, there's some artistic merit in that, but they don't care about my opinion. <laughs> but uh, yeah, same with like handing a paintbrush and paint to an elephant and they make something. There, there's just no copyright in that sort of thing and they've extended that reasoning to uh, artificial intelligence. So there's got to be a human behind this. Uh, now trademark area, there's not as much uh, problem there because it doesn't matter who creates the trademark, it's just how you're using it and if you're the first person to use it. But uh, in the AI space, you could have uh, AI engines using other people's trademarks in their development of material, and then you'd have potential trademark violations. So there's there's a whole host of area uh, of, of legal issues that are going to have to be sorted out from AI. Uh, 3D printing is another fun one. Uh, 3D printing to using 3D printing to make new products. Uh, I've, I've helped several clients uh, get patents in the 3D space. It's not just you've come up with a cool new 3D printer, but you've utilized the 3D printer in a new way to to make something new and uh, you can get a patent in that. Uh, using you tech, like 3D printing, using new technology to make something new, uh, you can use that as a basis to obtain patent protection. And employment agreements, I mentioned that earlier, those are very, very important. And they're gonna continue to be important because we are in a, in a job market where people are jumping everywhere, right? Uh, I've talked to manufacturers, uh, clients, that you know they'll have somebody come work for them for a while and then six months in the place down the street offers them 50 cents more an hour and they're gone and then you're going to keep doing that uh, as long as the labor market is tight and you have people jumping from job to job you need to have your employment agreements in place uh, you might not be able to get a non-compete clause depending on the job but you can at least make sure that your employment agreements lock up those IP rights employment agreements your consulting agreements your contract agreements whatever form your job takes uh, you want to have the right agreements in place so your IP rights are locked up in the people that are supposed to own them uh, another in interesting area is the unified patent court in Europe uh, Europe's got themselves a new court. Uh, we are waiting to see how it plays out. Some countries are using it, some aren't. But uh, the interesting thing is it, it's, they're trying to kind of streamline the system, make it easier to uh, deal with patent issues. 
uh, because right now Europe's crazy in a lot of ways and in the patent area you file your PCT application for instance then you nationalize it you file it in Europe Europe reviews your patent application you get it issued in Europe then you have to figure out which countries you're gonna nationalize it in. you gotta pay a fee in each one of those countries and then you can only enforce it in those countries it's a weird multi-tier system it's a pain in the butt to deal with it can get very very expensive so this unified patent court is kind of a way uh, this unified patent system in general is a way to try and streamline it a little bit i think make it a little bit cheaper a little bit easier uh, but we're still kind of taking a wait and wait and see approach and relying on our uh, foreign uh, council that we have our partners in in europe to kind of help us with that process um, ip valuation uh, also very important when you're evaluating a co company Having these documented IP rights in place, whether it be a patent or it be a documented trade secret that you're actually keeping secret, uh, that comes into play when you're evaluating the value of a company. And it's good, so that's why it's good to keep good notes on this stuff, to, to keep your patents, uh, you know, keep, keep track of them, to keep your trade secrets track of them. Uh, to have your copyrights kind of listed out, your copyright registrations and, and your trade se trademarks all kind of together so you know what they are. And that way, if you're trying to get a loan, you need collateral, you need to show your assets, you're trying to get a, you know, you're partnering with another company, a merger, or you're buying a company, you're selling your company. Having all that stuff listed out makes it easier to assign a dollar amount to your company, for instance. Um, that that is, is incredibly important. Uh, open source is another big area uh, that that's we actually have a, a partner who's kind of an open source expert out of uh, Texas and uh, that's a very interesting area because you know just because it says open source doesn't mean you can do anything with it and there's a pretty wide landscape there uh, that you have to uh, make sure you're using the open source material in the right way uh, biotech's all obviously very big uh, things like CRISPR if any of you heard of that technology uh, you know, this, this, it's amazing, uh, amazing the things that you can try and patent. And obviously, uh, like I mentioned, things, uh, things in nature already can't be patented. You know, uh, that includes bio, a lot of biotech, early ba basic bio, biology. But when you start altering it, that's when you kind of go after uh, patents. So, you know, for example, there's been some litigation around uh, like testing systems to test for a certain condition by looking at existing genes. Uh, it's very hard to get patents in that area because you're looking at existing genes, stuff that's already in nature. So, you know, you have to be very careful when you're trying to get patents in that area, uh, even though you do a ton of work in it. The amount of work you put into something does not affect whether or not you can get a patent on it. So especially in this area, these researchers will do a ton of work to try and find uh, the gene that causes certain thing. They can't get a patent in identifying that gene because that gene was already there. Uh, it's, it's a very, uh, that's why I'm glad I'm in mechanical engineering. I can, I can work with hard physical structures that make it easy to understand. Uh, and, and, and lastly, uh, interesting First Amendment case recently was uh, the Jack Daniels dog toy case uh, in, in the trademark space. Uh, you might have seen these dog toys that are like, they look like existing trademarks. Uh, and in this case, it was a Jack Daniels bottle that they had rebranded as a dog toy. They'd even changed the names of it a little bit. That went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's not, that's trademark infringement. You can't, it's not a parody. Uh, there's not one of the, one of the uh, fair uses that you can use a trademark for. That's a straight up trademark infringement. So it was fun watching that case. Uh, and, and seeing how that's going to play out. So the dog toys, you're probably not going to see as many dog toys that have, uh, have trademarks on them anymore. All right, so uh, that was probably like drinking from a fire hose. Can you say something about service marks? Service marks are basically trademarks for services, um, like the name says. Uh, so if you are uh, providing a service, you can get a trademark in that. Uh, you may not be labeling a product with it, but you're labeling, but you're using it in your marketing material, right? Uh, so you can get a trademark in that just, just like in a, a product itself. So if you're offering engineering services and you've got a cool name for that service, you can get a trademark in that as well. Two questions. Three. First one's a little lighthearted. 
bigger vanity design patents. Here's a spoon with my face on it. I want a patent in my name. Is that a thing? Have you seen people doing that? There's not a lot of trademarks or not trade design patents in printed materials. Um, I, I've seen them before, but it's it's more on physical structure that you get a patent or a, trade, a design patent on. Um, and I mean, you get a design patent on your face on something, it's only going to cover your face. They put another face on it, and you're not going to be able to really yeah, get one. You know, that's true. Uh, yeah, you that's, can. That's the whole vanity thing. Yeah, you can definitely do that. So, second question, and this one's a lot more serious. Um, I work for a, a consulting engineering firm. We're frequently hired by clients to develop equipment, mm -hmm. prototypes of equipment. They pay us to develop those, and we provide them the prototype, and then they provide them the designs. There's paperwork, we sign away rights to that equipment. Mm -hmm. But does that transaction constitute a sale that they then have to take to the patent office within a year? So that wouldn't be a sale of the invention itself. It's a sale of the design of an invention, if I'm understanding here correctly. That really wouldn't start that timer. It's really if you have a prototype made and by a third party company and you buy that prototype. Um, but, but hiring a company to design something for you is not, that doesn't start the timer, thankfully. Uh, it's, it's, thankfully, you don't have to worry about it in that situation. But yeah, it is good to have all those rights locked up, however, however they're gonna go in, in whatever agreement you have between those companies. Yes. Uh, do you find working with the government, they have qualified people to help you evaluate? <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Don't answer that. <laughs> this goes on YouTube. Don't answer that. Yeah. No, no. I will say examiners, they try and get examiners, patent examiners that match up to the technology area they're in. It's not a perfect system. Um, and, and some examiners are easier to work with than others. Um, some some kind of acknowledge that, yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert in this field, and uh, I'm going through it with an open mind, but can't always get them that way. Uh, some of them work in the art unit long enough, a technology area long enough, and they think they're experts. And sometimes they know stuff pretty well, but not as much as they think. It's, it, it really is very interesting. You can, the examiners you can get vary, very, very widely. Um, and, and some of them move fast, some of them move slow. And unfortunately, once you get one examiner, it's very hard to get a different examiner. You're going to have that examiner throughout. So. Our strategy is to work with them as closely as possible. Get them on your side. Uh, we schedule interviews with them. We, we make nice. Uh, and they also usually appreciate that too. They, they want, uh, the best examiners are ones that want to help you get a patent. Uh, there's still a few examiners left that take pride in not allowing anything, but I'm not seeing that nearly as much anymore. There are patent attorneys, patent agents. What other professions associated? What's the distinguishing feature? So a patent agent, uh, you can, it's, it's, you take with the United States Patent and Trademark Office to file patent applications, you have to take what's called a patent bar. It's a specific test, it's different than the bar you take to become an attorney. And you don't have to go to law school to take that test. Uh, there are three categories that you can use to take that test. Uh, one, you have a specific degree with a specific name that they're looking for. Engineering degree, a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, computer science, chemical chemical degree, a chemistry degree, something like that. If you have that exact name in your diploma, that's it. You qualify uh, of a specific technical background, or you've taken the uh, requisite load of science classes. You know, I, I know a lot of people from the '90s. Uh, their computer science degree didn't have the right name uh, because it was a new field, so all these different universities were given different names to their degrees. So. They weren't able to get a uh, automatic qualification for the patent bar, so they submitted their uh, their transcripts. Or one of my colleagues, while we were in law school, took a couple science classes on the side, got the requisite number of science classes, and was able to qualify. The third category is you take the fundamentals of engineering exam and pass it, and uh, then you can you can take it. Uh, once you take the test and pass it, which it's harder than the regular bar, it's got a much lower pass rate. Uh, it, it, it really is an archaic, like, here's all the 
weird regulations on filing a patent application. You got to know all those back and forth pretty well. Uh, once you pass the patent bar, then you become a patent agent. And then once you pass a state bar, then you become a patent attorney. You have to, you know, register. You have to give a paperwork to USPTO that says, "Here's here's proof that I passed the state bar." Uh, whatever state we're in, doesn't matter. And they don't care what state you're in as long as you have proof you passed it, and then you become a patent attorney. And that's really the only difference. So my firm, uh, we have four patent agents, like in my group with mechanical engineering degrees, and uh, then you know several attorneys too in that area. And once you pass the patent bar, uh, you can do whatever work, uh, patent work with the Patent and Trademark Office that you need to. You can't do trademark work, you can't do litigation, you can't do any other legal work, but you can do patent work. You can file patents, you can negotiate with patent uh, examiners and do all of that work. Have you ever been involved um, in cases that involve essential patents and the assignment of the FRAN, um, you know, reasonable fees to use that patent, like if they're needed for standards, mm -hmm. um, like cell phones are a big thing. I have not, um, I do not do any litigation work. I hand that off to my colleagues. I don't want to go in front of a court. Uh, I, I like the day-to-day -day getting a patent. Um, but in the end, yeah, when you file a patent litigation and you sue somebody and you win, uh, there comes a, uh, at the end is the damages question, what damages do you owe the other, you know, are owed to you if you're the patent owner? Uh, whether it be an injunction to prevent the other party from making, using, selling it, or maybe they just pay you a reasonable royalty rate, uh, that comes into play. Uh, I think those considerations come into play there. I don't have a lot of experience in that area, but you know, it, I, I think what you're, what you're getting to is if it's something that you really can't not sell, you know, some sort of essential idea that, that's needed by the market, uh, the court, I think, can set, all right, fine, you can keep selling it, but you got to pay these people this much per unit you sell or whatever, some percentage. Yes? Uh, Without using cuss words, how are they doing containing those? Those outfits to advertise, we'll help you get your invention uh, Oh, they're not. <laughs> there's, there's no, uh, there's no real framework around, you know, stopping those people. As long as, as long as they have patent bar people that are working on it, uh, patent agents and the like, uh, you know, there's no, there's not really much of an effort to, to crack down on those. I think that there is a patent, the pat, USPTO does have an ethics office. Um, I don't think they spend a lot of resources going after those parties, though. They're looking for really egregious stuff. And a lot of those companies, they do the bare minimum to hit their ethics standards. Um, but they're, and it depends company to big company, but yeah, a lot of those companies are, uh, you're not gonna get a lot, of, a lot of value out of them for even what little you might be paying them. I've had two close to between them over $12,000 went down the tubes. Yeah. They did nothing. Yeah, you pay them the money, they file something, you come to, you kind of rely on them, and then you realize what they filed was almost worthless. You got to pay the money regardless of what they do. Mm -hmm. Oh, they want it up front. <laughs> Could you speak to someone fraudulently claiming a patent? Yes. So you can. Uh, there, there is a framework to go after somebody. Uh, let's say they stole your invention. You're the inventor on it. You showed it to them. They went and filed their own patent application on it. That patent application with that, those inventors would be invalid because you legally have to list whatever inventor came up with the idea, whoever conceived of it. That's a legal question and is a basis to invalidate a patent. So, uh, in fact, we've been involved in litigation before where we have sued uh, a company for one of our clients that uh, filed their own patent, didn't list the client as the inventor, even though the client was the one that disclosed it to them. And uh, yeah, we were successful in that regard because yeah, they, uh, they didn't list. So you can, you have a few options there. You can try and invalidate the patent. Just say, yeah, they, they have this patent. They didn't invent it, I did. Or alternatively, add me as an inventor. You have to add me as an inventor because I, I helped you in, invent this. And therefore, I have a legal ownership in the patent. There's, there's ways to go about that. But 
it can be tough to prove that, right? Uh, you go show off a product at a trade show, you don't file your patent application on it. Uh, maybe you file it in time, but it turns out somebody saw your product, thought it was a cool idea, and then they ran to the patent office and filed theirs before you filed yours. They have priority, um, but so now it's on you to put together the evidence necessary to prove that they didn't come up with it. What is the provisional patent? The provisional patent, oh yes, I, I think I had that in one of my slides, but I didn't get to talk about it. It's a placeholder. Now you file a provisional patent application and for a utility, just utility patents, not for design patents, but for utility patents. You file a provisional, has sort of the same standards as a utility patent, uh, uh, description and drawings, you don't have to have claims. The drawings can be less formal. You know, your hand drawings would work in that case, or pictures or things like that. And you file it, and it gives you one year to file a full utility patent application. So often uh, startups, solo inventors will do this when they're trying to save some funds because it is a cheaper process. You don't have to get formalized drawings. You don't have to draft the claims. Uh, but uh, you file it, and um, then you have a full year to file your non-provisional utility patent application. It's a good placeholder. It's kind of like the PCT. The PCT is kind of the same concept. You have a file a placeholder application to file other applications later. So the provisional is good if you either uh, I'll see. I'll recommend it in two cases. One, it's it's cheaper and you need to save money. Or two, you're still developing the product. You don't know what the final product's going to look like. You know the general concept. You have maybe a basic idea of a first prototype. So you file the provisional on it. So you can say you're patent pending. You can go uh, look for business partners, investors. You can go talk to manufacturers that maybe can make a prototype for you. And uh, you're patent pending while you're talking to these people. And then when that one year deadline comes up, you file uh, an updated application that includes the original idea and your new idea. And that way you're, you're well covered. Or you can, file, you can file multiple applications too on iterations of your idea. You, know, you come up with the idea, you file a patent application on it. Two years later, you've modified it in some innovative ways. You want to file a patent application on that. You can keep protecting the, the different iterations of it with multiple patent applications. Would you speak to what I call the Thomas Edison myth? Make it, get a patent, you're rich. Yeah. Yeah, there is, a, there is a lot that goes into monetizing a patent. Um, and uh, some people think they can get a patent and go out and license it. I really didn't talk much about licensing, but yeah, you can license your technology. You can license any of your intellectual property, including trade secrets. Um, and uh, but the agreements are very important. You got to invest in it. Patents are not cheap either. I mean, you're talking design patents are cheaper. Utility patents are thousands of dollars um, just, to, just to get something filed. And then you, the negotiation of the patent office takes additional money. Uh, and, and maybe you get a patent in the end and the negotiation of the patent office you know, maybe maybe it's not that valuable of a patent. The patent examiner was so strict that your patent makes it very easy to design around. That's kind of the value of finding a good patent attorney that, that makes sure they're keeping in mind as they're negotiating, negotiating with the patent office, you know, uh, not to narrow your claim so much that, you know, a competitor can come along and say, yeah, now they, cl they claimed originally X, Y, and Z, during the art negotiations with the patent office, they added A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we can just leave out E and we're not infringing the patent anymore. Uh, so you want to be very careful and, and work closely with your attorney to make sure your claims don't go so narrow that the claims aren't valuable to you anymore. So there's no, there's no automatic, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing automatic about making money from a patent. Uh, it, it is an investment, just like any business, any startup. Um, you know, so yeah, you can't just get one and you know be uh, be ready to make a ton of money. I found it very interesting what you were, were saying about the trademarks that you have to continually use it. A while back, I worked for a uh, over hundred year old company that uh, used to make cash registers. 
and what they did was once every so often they would make uh, one piece of equipment and they would just completely cover it with like 50 or 60 of the various logos that they had used over the years yeah. and they would do that uh, just for the purpose of keeping them active and preventing somebody else from using it. Now, that's a that's I a risky. Wondered how, and I always wondered how long uh, they had to make, you know, how long it had to be in between each one of these that they would make. That is an interesting question. Um, if it's a trivial use, I don't know. There, there might be some argument that somebody comes along and says, "That's not enough to actually keep a keep a trademark alive." Uh, I'm not a trademark litigator, though, but there there definitely would be some arguments there that that's not enough. Um, it, it's very dependent on the case, facts of the case. Uh, but yeah, some, some companies will do a short run or just sell a few products uh, every now and then with the, with the old logos. Uh, they might sell t-shirts with the old logos on it or things like that just so they can say they're using the trademark in some way. Uh, there's, there's ways to continue use. Um, but yeah, I actually talked with a branding company recently that they, they come along, they kind of rebrand stuff. And I was like, so what do you do with the old logos? And they're like, we just... To tell the client not to use them anymore, and like, did you realize that you're giving up those logos? And they had no idea. So yeah, if you don't if you don't use it, use you lose it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that was informative. That was a lot of information. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Can I, can I like? Move it a tiny it. little bit. There you go. There's my, there's my information. I also have my card if anybody wants that. But happy to talk. Um, if you got any follow-up questions. Uh, like I said, I was kind of making you all drink from a fire hose tonight. So, But hopefully it was helpful. Thank you. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next meeting. We hope you enjoyed this presentation given at one of the Atlanta Metro Chapter meetings of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. To find out more about us or to join us, check us out at gspe.org.